أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين وإمام مجاهدين ولا آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. السلام. Brothers, we're talking about hypocrisy in democracy, and specifically we're looking at all of these arrests, detentions, torture, and we're asking ourselves what the hell's going on. And at the end of this, it's not going to be a long talk, but at the end of this, I want us to make a choice. You've got two options. And I'm going to give you the two options of how to look at the issue, A or B. And if you choose the wrong one, you'll never generate change. You'll always be following. You'll <coughs> always be the guy that doesn't know what's going on, can't see the issue for what it really means. And you're the one that's going to be led by the nose, by other people. If you take the right option, that means you can lead. It means you can show people what the answer is. And that's what I want us to get to at the end of tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so is there hypocrisy in democracy has to be the first question I answer. Can't just assume it, we are people of evidence after all. So when we're going to discuss hypocrisy in democracy, first question, is there? hypocrisy. The second, if there is, why? And the third, and this is important, what the hell do we do about it? I want us to take those three. So let me just quickly summarize again. Is there hypocrisy? If so, why? And then what do we do? So I'm going to give you some of the examples and maybe that will help you see if there's hypocrisy. I'm sure you've heard all the names, Baba Ahmed, You've heard the names, right? Afia Siddiqui, you've all heard the names. So, the stories of each of these people actually expose a different bit of hypocrisy each time. And if you want to know more, you can read. And there's a, one guy, Andy Worthington, he'd done some brilliant stuff on the Guantanamo files. You can read more stuff from, I say, Clive Stafford Smith, Jane Mayer. I can put all these names up perhaps on the Facebook page for Ministry of Doubt. But at the end, you're going to have a lot of things you can look at. So I'm not going to give you the full stories, but just enough. So let's look at Baba Ahmed to start off with. Now, Baba's accused of a lot of things. But basically, he ran a website at a time when it wasn't illegal. And he ran a few websites. And guess what? In 2003, they raided his house. And you know when people raid your house, anti-terror, it ain't nice. It ain't nice at all. And what they did to him was bad, even by normal standards of raids. They got a doctor to check him afterwards, <clears throat> after the beating. 73 forensic injuries. He had blood in his ears, in his urine. Because they took their time with him. They put his head into sujood and asked, where's your God now? And they stamped on him. And they made sure that when they put the handcuffs on him behind his back, they moved it in certain ways so that he would get pins and needles, so that he'd be damaged. They wanted to damage him. They wanted to hurt him. They wanted to break him, humiliate him in front of his wife. You know, after a week, he was released because they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. Think about that. No evidence. Not enough evidence, anyway. He went to court, got £60,000 compensation from the Met for the beating. Yeah? It's a serious thing to get compensation from the Met, yeah. to get 60 k They even managed to charge the four officers for actual bodily harm. Unfortunately, um, the four got off the jury only get 45 minutes to say, OK, they're, they're, they're free. <clears throat> and by the way, the jury at the end of the trial said we'd like the opportunity to shake hands with each of the four officers. That's what happened in the, in the case. But America, they want Baba Ahmed. And remember, the British don't have enough evidence to charge him. But you know the Americans want him anyway. They don't have any evidence, they don't care. So Baba Ahmed faces, essentially faces life, the rest of his life in a supermax prison. 
in America. If he's if he's going to get over, it. he's fighting it, but he's he's going to face the rest of his days in what is what one warden, former warden, said of the prison: a clean version of hell, where they lock you up for like 23 hours a day. They deprive you of any contact with people so that you slowly go mad. That's what they want to do to Baba Ahmed. <clears throat> and there's some hypocrisy here, right? Because the law lord, Lord Carlyle, he was saying that, look, it's all his fault. Why is he fighting it? If he wasn't fighting, he'd have gone already. But there's another guy, just happened to be non-Muslim, but another guy, Gary McKinnon, he hacked into the NASA and Pentagon websites. He said he was looking for evidence of UFOs. I don't know what the guy's doing. <laughs> but Lord Carlyle's saying, oh no, don't let him go. He says there's no doubt that Mr. McKinnon could be prosecuted in this country, given that the acts took place in this country, same as Baba. The English legal system is perfectly positioned to deal with cases of this nature, making the extradition both unnecessary and disproportionate, same as Baba. <coughs> Moreover, decision to prosecute here would be without precedent. There have been at least three other cases of hacking into US computer systems that have been prosecuted in the UK. So why are we treating differently? You see how the law lords are saying, Mr. McKinnon, Mr. UFO <coughs> hacker, he should be kept here. But with Barber, send him. His fault. And he's got another co-defendant, Talha Ahsan, same issue. He's going to go. And you know how, why the Americans want him? Because one of the websites, back in the 90s, had a server that was, for a little while, in Minnesota. That's why. That's why the Americans want him. Something on a website, which was legal at the time, later, they didn't like it. But because it was on a server held in Minnesota, the Americans can take you for the rest of your life. Think about it. You all heard about Abu Qatada. You may have heard the recent story about this brother. This is a long story, I'm going to keep it short. Abu Qatada became famous because of something that happened in 1991. Yeah? In Algeria, the Muslims tried to take power in an election. They tried to take power in an election. And then what happened was the government cancelled the elections, called the French government in, in Algeria, and they started massacring the people. And it went to civil war. 200,000 dead. 200,000 dead. Abu Qatada had given a fatwa, saying, under these circumstances, you can threaten violence. He didn't say you can do it. He said you can threaten certain types of violence. And certain people started to go a bit overboard. And Abu Qatada even said, look, I'm not with you. I don't agree with that. He's currently fighting extradition. And you know how they got him? They got him because two other people, Bisha Arawi and Jamil Albana, they were both interrogated. They were both kidnapped and taken to Afghanistan and asked, tell us about Abu Qatada. And they beat them. And they tortured them. And they said whatever they had to say. And now Abu Qatada is fighting. He's been held without charge since 2002 in Belmarsh. And you know what? Even the House of Lords said, you know what? This is out of order. So you know what the government did? They changed the law. <clears throat> so they could keep holding it. They changed the law. Now you know what they're trying to do to him? They're trying to send him to a country far away where they know he'll be tortured. And they're asking for a country to take him that will torture him, no doubt. But to give a piece of paper saying, please don't. Imagine a country that's going to torture you. But they just want a piece of paper that says, no, I won't. And the British government's going to take that piece of paper and say, look, he's not going to get tortured. <laughs> Goodbye. That's what's happening to Abu Qatada. Omar Khadir. Anyone heard of him? Child soldier picked up in Afghanistan at 15. They say he threw a grenade. No one knows. They shot him twice in the back. He was blinded in one eye. He needed an operation to save him. And as he lay there asking for help, they interrogated him. 
They asked question after question because they couldn't get the answer they liked. The American soldiers said, well, you're not going to get the operation to save your eye. He lost his eye. He's had, he's had some serious things happen to him. He had a shoulder injury, so they made him carry heavy things, threatened him with military dogs. And remember, he's 15. They deprived him of sleep. They refused him the chance to do his salah. He went on hunger strike. They force fed him. He's become Hafiz, by the way. And now he's eligible for release because he made a plea deal. He's Canadian, actually. The Canadian government doesn't want him back. That's what's happening right now. He's not the youngest, by the way. Muhammad Jawad was 12. He's the kind of guy that you end up in these places. Jose Padilla, in heard of him? They put him in isolation, such crazy isolation. You know, when they stop you from hearing and seeing and talking and from seeing anyone, any contact. They put him under such incredible isolation for the first two years or so that he's now effectively insane. He was, he was actually arrested for a dirty bomb plot they found out never existed. They convicted him for 17 years. It keeps going, man. I can keep going. Tarek Mahana. You know, he got put away 17 and a half years for putting a video up on YouTube. Material support for the jihad is what they called it. Think about it. Putting stuff up on YouTube. Shakar Amr. Anyone heard of him? He's the last Londoner left in Guantanamo. He was teaching people in Afghanistan before the invasion. He was teaching. And when he knew the Americans were coming, he got his pregnant wife and his three kids as safe as he could. But when he went into hiding, it was too late. Bounty hunters found him. They got him, they sold him. The next bounty hunters sold him. The next one sold him. Until one day he was being driven somewhere. He thought, that's it, they're going to end me now. And he heard helicopters. And he thought, the Americans, I'm saved. Didn't work out that way. They kept him at Bagram. They forced him awake for nine days straight. Awake without food or sleep for nine days straight. And they used, there's different types of torture the Americans use these days. One of them is to keep you cold. They kept him so cold, they threw water on him and left him in the winter for so long, his feet got frostbite. So they would beat his feet. That's what they would do to him. So he said whatever he could, because he, he didn't know what he was saying, he ended up in Guantanamo. And then he saw a man doing salah being beaten in his salah by the guards. I mean, obviously the guys were angry because they see how the Qur'an is disrespected in front of them. But to see that man being beaten as he tried to do his salah, so he organized a hunger strike. He actually led the other believers in Guantanamo on a hunger strike. So they put him in solitary confinement. They're trying to slowly break him. And you know what's really, really sad? Is that the Bush administration admitted in 2007 they didn't have any evidence and they cleared him for release. The Obama administration agreed. 2009, no evidence, he's clear for release. Guess where he still is? He's still there. Still alone, six foot by eight foot windowless cell. There's more, bruv. And I can keep going. And I think it's important you know that it's not just a few people. When we're talking about what's happening, it's not just one or two people. But I'm giving you stories that you may not have heard. How about Jubair Ahmed? Jubair produced and uploaded a five-minute video onto YouTube. Five minutes. <coughs> He got charged with 23 years. He managed to get away with 12 years, though. And what's crazy about it is that he's not calling to violence. But even if he was, this guy's from Virginia, right? Even if he was, the Americans aren't even looking at their own laws. The First Amendment's about free speech and all that. And they have something in it where one guy, in, I think 1969, a Ku Klux Klan leader threatened violence against some officials in a speech, and he got put away. 
the Supreme Court in America overruled it because they said, look, he didn't actually do it. He has the right, the Supreme Court, it's Brandenburg versus Ohio, yeah, 1969. The Supreme Court said he can actually threaten violence. He's protected under the First Amendment. They used that for the KKK. They didn't use that for Jubair Ahmed. Munir Faruqi, you heard about Munir Faruqi? He had a dawah store. Two people came up to him and said, we're interested in Islam, and they took shahada. Turns out they were feds. Turns out they were recording him. It turns out that Munir had been trapped, entrapped. And now they're trying to take his family home away from him. So he's already, he's already locked up. They're trying to punish his family. How about Binyam Muhammad? No? Binyam is a river who traveled to the Muslim world so he could get away from the bad crowd. So he could get away from drugs. And you know when they got him? He was tortured in different countries. Pakistan, Morocco, Afghanistan. At one time they got a razor blade. You know scalpel they use for surgery? And they just started to cut him. And he said, this is his words, they took the scalpel to my right chest. Only a small cut, maybe an inch. At first I screamed, I was just shocked. I wasn't expecting it. Then they cut my left chest. 20 to 30 times they then went after his private parts. For the next two hours, they cut and they cut and they cut. And they said to him that they should cut it off. Better just to cut it off. You'll only breed terrorists. He got put into a place called the Dark Prison. And believe me, no one knows where the Dark Prison is. People say they think it's in Afghanistan. People sometimes think it's the salt pit, which is also in Afghanistan. But we only know where the salt pit is because some journalist found out on Google Maps where he thinks it is and actually travelled with a long lens camera trying to work out where it is. And he found a goat herder with a, with a cap on, baseball cap with the words Kellogg Brown Root. And this isn't the company that makes cereal. Yeah? Kellogg Brown Root are the military subcontractors for Halliburton. They're the guys that provide all the you know, assassinations and all that kind of stuff. So that's where we find out where the salt pit is, but we don't know where the dark prison is. And in the dark prison, Binyam, he was tied up for days. When they give him food, or when they, when they take him for interrogation, even the guards are using flashlights. And they played the Eminem show CD. They played Eminem CD, Dr. Dre. They played all of that 20 days straight. Just played it 20 days straight at a volume that you couldn't understand. You couldn't, couldn't stay awake. You couldn't sleep, sorry. Imagine that, blasting that sound at you in the dark. And he said also they, they would change it into horrible ghost laughter and Halloween sounds. He ended up memorizing it and starting to go mad. That's the kind of stuff that's happening right now. Why do you think I'm telling you all of these stories? Think about the title. Is there some hypocrisy here? Is there something where one set of values are being told to you and another one is being lived? Can you see a double standard? There's one guy, Muhammad Hamid. One of, the, one of the evidences they used against him in court for terrorist training was he went paintballing. Yeah? But this is, this is really bad. This is really bad. Because that's happened to other people. The evidence they showed was a BBC documentary called Don't Panic, I'm Islamic, where the BBC paid for him to go paintballing. And that was the evidence they used to say he's going terrorist training. These are the kind of things happening. Did you hear about Azhar Ahmed? He was on Facebook and he was talking about those British soldiers that died. People gassing about the deaths of soldiers. He's been charged, I think first of all with a racially aggravated, but they changed it to sending in a grossly offensive message because they know the first one won't stick. But what was funny was that all of the other people who started to write on his page saying he's disgusting, he should be hanged, he should be shot, Lots of people threatening violence on his page afterwards. Nothing happened to them. Nothing. 
keep, I can keep going. There's one guy, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Everyone says that he's the mastermind behind 9-11. He was waterboarded 183 times in the first month. Now, do you know what waterboarding is? Waterboarding is to make you think <coughs> you're going to drown. Yeah? It's to lay you flat and then a little bit lower. So your head's a little bit lower than your feet. And to put a bag over your head and then slowly pour water. And you know what? Even though you know you're not drowning, your body starts to react as if you're drowning. You feel like you're going to have a heart attack. 183 times. So how many things do you think he confessed to? One, two, five. Do you think he'd say anything? Confessed to 31 things. He confessed to so many things that some of them don't make sense. He said he planned to assassinate Jimmy Carter. I mean, he was president in 1977. He just said anything. But one of the things that's really sad was that Afia Siddiqui's second husband's uncle is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Because basically he talked about his family. He talked about anything. And not long after he broke, Afia Siddiqui was kidnapped with her three children on the streets of Pakistan. Of course, you know, you can say that you caught this woman with all these plans and with chemicals, but do you know what they charged her with? They charged her with one thing, that after they'd caught her, that she'd found a gun and tried to shoot it. And somehow, no one else got hurt but her. She got shot twice. And there's no fingerprints on the gun, by the way. In court, they admitted, yeah, there's no fi her fingerprints aren't on the gun. And we can't even prove that she actually fired anything. But that was 6,000 miles away. You know, it happened. Trust it. How many years do you think she got? 86 years. They didn't get her on the original thing, because there was no original thing. They got her for being shot, basically, by American soldiers. And look, it can keep going. Samuel Hajj, he's an um, Al Jazeera cameraman. They kidnapped an Al Jazeera cameraman. And you know what they interrogate him on? Is Al Jazeera connected to Al-Qaeda? That's what they keep doing. He's on hunger strike. And you know, to punish him, they take a 43-inch feeding tube, and they put it through the nose, all the way into the stomach. And you know, to make it worse, they pull it out and put it in twice a day. They don't use all the lotion and they, they're rough. I remember reading how it's going to be done for the 479th time because he was on hunger strike all that time. I can keep going, bro. But let me just say it straight. Can you see some sort of problem here if all of these things are happening? And I could keep going. I could talk to you about PREVENT, the Patriot Act. I can talk to you about how recently the government has announced plans that it would get all internet providers to install software. That means that they can snoop on anything that you do. Any text, any phone call, any website you go, all, all histories, everything, the lot. They're doing that with all companies. They were starting to do that now, snooping all over the place, going after your privacy. Shall I tell you why there's hypocrisy here? Because in the West, they talk about certain principles. I'm going to give you those principles. I'm going to ask you do, you, think, do you think there's any hypocrisy? One of them is the right to due process. It means that they can't just take you and do what they want. They have to deal with you in a certain way, a way that everyone can see is open and fair. Right? You see that's what their principle is. But what happened to Imam Anwar al-Awla? Do you know what happened to him? Barack Obama gave the order for something called extrajudicial assassination. And when they call it extrajudicial, it doesn't mean there's extra law. It means above the law. Drone strike. 
no evidence, no charge, no arrest, no trial. They went after a U.S. citizen, Kobla. Or at least they say they did. How about free speech? That's their principle, right? Can you see free speech maybe being compromised here by some of the actions that we've seen? Like Tarek Mahana. Think about it. How about habeas corpus? Habeas corpus is very simple. In Latin, it's where's the body? You have the body. It's basically saying you can't arrest someone and just hide them. You can't disappear them for years. You will be asked to bring the person, bring the person to us. Well, what happened to all these people that have been detained and disappeared for years? No charge, no trial. How about the right to a fair trial? <clears throat> How about jury trial? How about subjudice? Subjudice is that you can't talk about a case that's going on, otherwise you prejudice it. People will start to get an opinion on it. So think about what they said about Abu Hamza. You remember Abu Hamza? You know one of the nicknames they have for our brother Abu Hamza is Captain Hook. Captain Hook. And they keep talking about him. And they keep talking about him. And the same actually, Abu Qatada. With Abu Qatada, he's been called Al-Qaeda. Bin Laden's right-hand man in Europe. Isn't it? They keep talking about these people. And when they do, they would in other cases have the other cases thrown out. But not with us. Not with Muslims. I'm going to give you more examples, if you like. But it'll only prove the same point. That whenever these principles are given to you, justice, freedom, fair trial. You know there's also a right where you have a right not to incriminate yourself. In America they call it pleading the fifth. You know the fifth amendment is you, you're not going to be forced to say something that means that you're guilty. They have to catch you. You don't have to force, you can't be forced to say you're guilty, right? But you know what torture is? Torture is forcing you to incriminate yourself. All of their rights that they talked about for years, all of those rights are gone. You might ask yourself this other question, presumption of innocence. Are you innocent until proven guilty in the West? Should you be? Not if you're Muslim. Can you trap someone? Meaning, can you go to someone and say, look, here's 50 grand, do a crime. And when he does it, the guy says, I was a police officer, all along, you're nicked. What you should be able to say is, hold on, that's entrapment. It won't stick in court. Because you tried to trap me. You tried to provoke me into doing the, the crime. True, right? But what happened to Munir Faruqi? When he had the police officers, the undercover police <coughs> officers, come to his dawah store. <clears throat> There's even a guy called Craig Montelet who's saying he does the same in Southern California. The point is, every single principle that they have in the West when it comes to their rights and freedom, when it comes to us, I can give you example after example after example how they've all gone. And you know what? In order to beat the law, they've made new law. In the UK, the Terrorism Act was in 2000. In 2001, they made a new one, Anti-Terrorism, <coughs> Crime and Security. In 2005, they made a new one, Prevention of Terror. In 2006, they made another one, Terrorism Act. 2008, they made a new one, Counter-Terrorism Bill. Why do you think they're making all these laws? Because they're trying to change them. How about America? In America, they did Executive Order 13224 straight after 9-11. Then before the year was out, they did another one, which was the Patriot Act. Then 2002, they did another one, Homeland Security Act. And again, they did the Safety Act. Then 2005, Border Protection, Anti-Terrorism, Illegal Immigration Control Act. Then again the same year, Real ID Act. Then they amended the Patriot Act and did a Military Commissioning Act, 2006. Why are they making all these laws? Why are they making all these laws? The reason why is because they have thrown away over 
all of those years, hundreds of years of Western civilization, all these things they talk about, things that they hold dear, in the space of a few years, they decided to throw it all away to deal with Muslims. That's the situation that we're in. Can you see that? I'm going to ask you this question. Are you going to see this as A or B? You remember at the very beginning of the talk, I said I'm going to give you A or B. Are you going to say, oh, you know the West, they've thrown away their values. Why don't we remind them of their values and maybe they'll be nice to us. Maybe they'll apply it to us. Option A. You can lobby. You can go to your MP. You can sign the petition. You can organize something, maybe, to remind people that they should give you those rights. Or option B. You can realize that you're in a battle of ideas. A battle for hearts and minds. And it's a battle that's very clearly about the West versus Islam. The war on terror doesn't exist. I'm going to be controversial and say it's not even a war on Islam because they like British Islam, because they're making them. So it's a war on a specific type of Islam. And they might call it political Islam. And I'd say it's not even that. This is a war to prevent anyone gaining power and authority and statehood for a certain type of Islam. That's what this is about. If you think that this is just a few actions and a few isolated cases, you're going to get it wrong. The war on terror is about stopping people like you starting to think about Islam, thinking that it needs to be united with authority in a state. The war on terror is built for that. And I'll give you an example of why. Recently there was a man called Muhammad Gul. And again, he got a couple of years in prison for putting a video up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And you know when he put that video up, the judges, they said, that the war on terror should be defined as this. An act by an insurgent against the armed forces of a state anywhere anywhere in the world which sought to influence a government and were made for political purposes. What they're saying is, if you're not in a state, if, you don't, if you're not part of a state, you have no right to fight. You have no right to defend yourself. And what is that bias towards? It's bias towards a world where there is no state for the Muslims. It's biased for a world where every single invasion that takes place in the Muslim world and every single response to it is characterized as the state is good, the non-state is bad. The state is legal, the non-state, those individuals who are fighting, are terrorists. That's the world you live in now. And that's a world that's been put in place to prevent people from gaining power for Islam. So do you look at it, my brothers? Option A, oh, let's remind them of their values, maybe they'll be nice to us. Or option B, okay, let's wake up. This is a war of ideas, a battle for hearts and minds. And this is taking place to create a climate of fear and to stop ideas spreading that will lead to Muslims reuniting and becoming what they need to be, independent, in control of their destiny and trying to live and implement Islam. And that's how you know there's hypocrisy, my brothers. Remember I said at the very beginning, is there hypocrisy? Would you agree there is? Mm. Why? The why is because these people are willing to throw away all of their values, all of their traditions, all of their principles to stop you. When the Soviets were up against the West, do you know what they thought? They thought, well, they've got their state already, we have to break it. But with the Muslims today, this is the issue. With the Muslims today, you don't have a state. They're trying to prevent you from getting the state. So now you can see why the laws are coming. Now you can see why they keep making new laws. Why they keep stopping you from putting videos on YouTube. Why you'll get in trouble for having a bookshop that sells 
milestones by Said Qutb. You can see now where all of this is going. Western governments don't want you to think about those things, spread the ideas about those things, because if you do, you might kick-start a revival. And I said to you the third question I want to answer. What is it that it means for you? Your goal is to kickstart that revival. Your goal is to make sure that every single Muslim is talking about how we need to unite, how we need Islam only and confidence only in Islamic solutions, how that we will seek our izza and our progress with Islam alone. And that means khilaf. <coughs> if you can see that, then you know what to do and you know the work that is yours. You publicly must be calling for this. So they're not just going after ones and twos and sending them away into dark holes for eight years and 15 years. That is your work. So to recap, is there hypocrisy in democracy? in Western values. Every single one of those cases show you something. Why? Because they're trying to prevent you from regaining your independence and your unity and your strength. And the very last thing, what should you do about it? Realize, my brothers, you're part of this battle for hearts and minds. And the battle will come to your door. And you have to make a decision about what you're going to do. Good, Cody has a